Okay, but what about Shireen Abu Akleh? She was murdered by Israeli forces. Right, CNN just agreed to this. These are your two greatest allies in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and Again, Israel. They uh, have murdered American journalists and there have been absolutely no repercussions. And you're sitting up here talking about the freedom of press and democracy. The United States is denying sovereignty to tens of millions of people around the world with draconian sanctions for electing leaders that you do not like. Why is there no accountability for Israel or Saudi Arabia for murdering journalists? It is one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a journalist in Palestine. I deplore the loss of, uh, of Shireen. Um, she was a remarkable journalist, an American citizen, uh, as you all know. And there too, we are determined to follow the facts and get to the truth the facts of what happened. Found Secretary Blinken, no, all they have not been, no they, all I'm sorry, with respect, they have not yet been established. Yes, we're that has. For, no, they have not. If we were looking for an independent, credible investigation, when that investigation happens, we will follow the facts wherever they lead. It's, it's uh, as straightforward as that. That has not yet happened, but it's something that we very much want to see happen. And we'll have time after Thank the you. panel, of course, Thank to talk you. more about Thank this. You. Yes. Shout out Abby Martin. Left for me. I'm Matt Lack. Hello, David. Hey, Matt. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing... I agitated. I'm, I'm a little bit agitated today. That's good. Think. But uh, it's a good sort of agitation. I think I felt this way before. Uh, it's a little smooth fade there. Um, but uh, yeah, how is how's it going down there? It's warm down there, right? It's, it's hot as hell in Texas right now. But, uh, you know, I'm doing good. And I think I'm a little bit agitated, too. We got a hell of a lot uh, coming for everybody today. In just a little bit, we're going to be joined uh, by our friend, journalist uh, Kurt Hackbarth uh, down from Oaxaca, Mexico, um, who is going to be joining us to talk about AMLO and Biden's disastrous Summit of the Americas, where he has excluded uh, countries from attending this summit, which is supposed to be a summit where all the countries of the Americas come together and negotiate and come to terms on different subjects. Um, AMLO, along with other leaders, have boycotted uh, the event. So we'll be talking about that dynamic and a potential reshuffling of power across the Americas, which is a very, very good thing. And then just remind folks that all June we're doing what we're calling summer streams, um, which uh, we're going to be making the post game. So typically the post games are for our patron members only, but we're going to be making those public exclusively on Twitch. You can find us at twitch.tv slash left reckoning. And today we got a really, really fun guest uh, for all of y'all, our good friend and comrade, uh, Dr. Ben Burgess, the debunker himself, oh, yeah. uh, will be joining us uh, to talk about his recent travels and his uh, moments interacting with a very, very famous uh, Slovenian uh, philosopher, Slavoj Žižek. Uh, him and I are going to be having a quick but friendly debate on the question of Bernie 2024. Uh, we're going to be breaking uh, and down and debunking uh, Stephen Crowder. Ted Cruz and a hell of a lot more things and also taking y'all's questions. So be sure to join us over there, probably at like 830 Central, 930 Eastern. Um, so be sure to do that. We'll also be discussing Blake Masters at a McDonald's. Blake oh, McDonald's. yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you're not going to want to forget this. Uh, fast food <laughs> the hamburger culture. himself. Fa fascisms meets fast food culture <laughs> in the first summer stream of June. But yeah, we got to end up, you know, also we'll just do the pitch right up front uh, this weekend. It is the Think Tank. So again, if you're not familiar with the show or what we do, Think Tanks are, we take user, I say user, Jesus Christ. Uh, we take listener submitted <laughs> questions and voicemails. So I know, I know. I'm, just, I'm reading too much business press these days, man. It's starting to bleed into my like everyday brain. But um we, we take questions uh, from people in our community, and we usually like them to be you know, a little bit more like pie in the sky, a little bit more philosophical, hist historical. So be sure if you're a patron already to submit questions to that. And if you're not, it's a great time to sign up. Um, but yeah, maybe we should get to the, uh, the, the top story tonight, yeah, uh, let's which do is going to be about what's happening generally um, in the economy. And it's, it's a very, very worrying uh, time as we're seeing the Federal Reserve and tacitly, the Biden administration, take a name at your wallet. But before we get there, I think people who watch a lot of left-wing media, they're familiar with a lot of the indicators about how unequal our society is, how difficult it is for working people to get by. But I wanted to zero in on a specific group of folks just to paint the picture of how shared this misery is for American working people. We're going to talk about mobile homes for a little bit. 
So mobile homes are oftentimes derided by folks um, who don't understand the needs and the opportunities that they oftentimes give people in areas where there's underinvestment in housing, where cities are basically failing to create affordable housing for folks. It's not to make it seem like don't, people don't mistake me and think that the mobile home industry is some benevolent industry, but this kind of like upper middle class, like liberal snide, oh, you live in a trailer park, you know, looking down on folks is not only nasty, um, but it really just shows a real ignorance as to why these things exist. 20 million people, or about 6% of the United States citizens, live in mobile homes. And as I noted before, oftentimes these parks are developed because there has been a failing from the state, the federal government, and your local government to be able to provide housing for the people who, the people who work in your community, the people who make that system run, right? They oftentimes fail to house those folks. And people who are living in mobile homes have always been one publicly derided and then also preyed upon by some of the nastiest folks um, out there, people who are just trying to make a quick buck on them. And it's getting worse now. So as you're seeing, rents are rising in cities, housing prices are exploding, basically cutting off an entire generation of people from home ownership. You're only you can only imagine that the demand and the need for more and more people to be housed in mobile homes is going to rise. The scary thing is, is that in that, um, that sector as well, we're seeing a very, very significant push um, and increase in prices. So this is a piece uh, from the Washington Post a few days ago called We're All Afraid Massive Rent Increases Hit Mobile Homes by Abba um, Batarari. Um, and this is a quote from it. Nationally, the average sales prices of manufactured homes has risen nearly 50% during the pandemic from $82,900 to $123,200, census data shows. Meanwhile, average new home prices rose 22% in that period, according to government figures. And we can put it away. But, um, and this is notable, right? Because when we're talking about what's happening to people who are living in that situation, it's worthwhile to remember that there is actually not a lot of metrics that are kept up to date to be able to do the kind of long-term analysis as to what is happening to people's rents um, who live in mobile homes, right? So we're seeing the prices go up uh, on, on housing much, much more, as, as that quote just noted, than what we've even seen in housing, right? I mean, we're talking something near, um, you know, a nearly 50% increase in the cost of a mobile home right now. And as I said, as people have historically relied on this, who we were sort of priced out of um, the housing market, were priced out of the rental market, you're seeing that even that goal of maybe being able to own your own mobile home to live in, to house your family in, um, is becoming more and more unattainable. So we're seeing this push, right, on just the actual cost of the mobile homes themselves. But you also have to remember, and a lot of people, if you're not familiar, if you don't live in, in, in communities where, you know, where people are, are living um, in, in trailer parks, you might not be aware of how that system typically works. Now, everything is, you know, there, there are differences in different communities, but a lot of people hear the word mobile home and they think, okay, well, you know, you live in a park and you can move it. It's not really how it works. So just because of the actual structure of the mobile homes, the longer that you live somewhere, the more likely um, it is that you actually are, are, are unable to move your mobile home, right? Because they sink into the earth and you may be put on an addition to give yourself maybe a larger bedroom or bathroom or something like that. So yeah, you own the home, but you don't own the land underneath it. And what that means is for the people who own those trailer parks, they have a captive market where that they where they can just constantly increase the rents and the prices on them. And as, as you've seen from your landlord and from all of these other housing industries out there, prices are certainly going up. So while we don't have like the actual studies to be able to tell you the percentage nationwide, anecdotally from the people who do reporting on this, they are all reporting that people are getting significant increases in their rents um, uh, who are living in, in mobile home parks. They don't get the same kind of security as a homeowner does. And it certainly is a racket and it was a racket before the pandemic and it's only getting worse. And there are some solutions to this and we'll talk about some ways we could do this on a national level, but it's worth noting if you could pull this piece up real quick, Matt, um, that like right here in Austin in 2015, the Austin City Council voted 
um, to fund a permanent tenant advocacy group um, called BASTA. And Greg Kassar, who is now running for Congress, was very um, influential in that move. And through this organization, they basically were able to acquire public funds to be able to buy this mobile home park. So instead of it being something where you have a private company, a private individual on top, basically sucking up your rents, it was something that was community owned, which gave people in that community the security to say, I own this home, this is my home, and nobody's going to be able to take it away from me by pricing me out of the community, right? This is something that is good. This is a transition from private to public that we should certainly be supporting. And we'll come back to trailer parks um, and, and mobile homes in just a minute. Um, but I just wanted to note that because I think for a lot of people, um, that might be an image to help them understand just how dire things are getting. Right on top of the Fox News segments and the MSNBC segments about how nobody wants to work anymore, you're seeing the squeeze on working people across the board in this country. And we're going to talk about inflation in a second, but one of the most notable inflation that we have been seeing in our lifetime is not the pal paltry wages that workers get. It's the amount of rents that landlords can extract from you. It's the amount of increase in home prices that we've seen. It's also the increase in mobile homes. So ben, yeah, can I just jump yeah, yeah. in right there? Cool, like even, even like the um, uh, like student loan inflation, for instance, you can't strike take that away from real estate inflation because as somebody who got big student loans to move to this place I am now, a lot of that was going towards rent, mm -hmm. right? Like, and uh, anyway, continue. No, no, I, I, this is a, a crucial point. And it really does matter on the policy level because this is what they're going to do. So Ben Norton um, of multi, uh, Multipolarista uh, wrote a piece that was also reprinted in the monthly review called U.S. Federal Reserve says its goal is to get wages down. And he went through... Um, Jerome Powell, the Fed chair's statements from early May uh, and broke down what he is saying that the Federal Reserve, right, effectively our central bank in this country, right? It's not a one-to-one, -one, but effectively our central bank in this country, what their plan is to do about inflation. And if you could put up this first slide here, Matt. This is uh, Fed chair Jerome Powell. There's a path by which we would be able to have demand moderate in the labor market and have Therefore, have vacancies come down without unemployment going up because vacancies are at such an extraordinarily high level. There are 1.9 vacancies for every unemployed person, 11 and a half million vacancies to 6 million unemployed people. Now, I just want to remind folks we did this on the show. I'll put it in the show notes later. Um, but we did an entire show on what Marx calls the Industrial Reserve Army of Labor, right? Which is one of the nastiest aspects of capitalism is that capitalism tries to make working people compete against each other. They try to make you compete against your coworker by having you accept a lower wage, um, which then collectively lowers the wage, um, the wage floor and allows capitalists to get away with making more profit at the expense of the, uh, the, uh, of the value that is going to workers in, this in, in the form of wages, right? And I wanted to note that just because um, th that first bit, he might not use the same kind of terminology, Powell, but he's thinking in that kind of terminology, right? It's very, very bad um, that there are more vacancies than people who are applying for jobs because that means that businesses have to compete for workers versus workers having to compete against each other to get a job. We talked yesterday on the Griscom stream about what's going on in the trucking community, uh, where again, there's the same kind of, nobody wants to work anymore. These young people are lazy and they don't want to do this kind of industry. They don't want to work in this kind of industry. Turns out studies have shown that no, it's not that people don't want to work. And I said this last night, but <laughs> you know, I've been a part of working class America my entire life. I know a lot of people. You can say a lot of things about working Americans, but you cannot call them lazy. Boy, you cannot do that. What's happening in the trucking industry is like what's happening in a lot of other industries is people were saying, you know what? I'm not going to take a job that makes me work 60 hours a week and doesn't pay me overtime when I can stay in my community and find a job that pays me overtime. It's not perfect but it's a hell of a lot better than what I was doing before. That's why there's a trucker shortage right now. It's functionally a wage shortage. So that's the kind of shit that we're seeing from the Federal Reserve when they're thinking about this uh, reserve army of labor. And if you could put up this uh, second bit here, Matt, because this puts it very, very clearly. And this is, this is economist speaking. I'll try to uh, explain it a little bit to you all what he's exactly he's saying. Um, by moderating demand, we could see vacancies come down, right? 
And as a result, and they could come down fairly significantly, and I think put supply and demand at least closer together than they are. And that would give us a chance to have lower, to get inflation, to get wages down. I'm going to say that again, to get wages down and then get inflation down without having to slow the economy and have a recession and have an unemployment rise materially. So there's a path to that. So that's what we're getting right now from the Federal Reserves, the, the, the Federal Reserve, the people who are sitting at the height of the economy, making decisions that have significant trickle down effect on the shop that you work at, the grocery store that you shop at, um, the car dealership that you buy a vehicle from, right? This is the kind of thing that they're thinking about. Let's get wages down and then maybe inflation will fall along with it, right? They are very, very worried about this situation where workers are not as desperate as they were two to three years ago. And maybe I'll just, let me, uh, let me debunk one thing real quick for y'all. Wages are not what is driving inflation. If you could put up the last slide, Matt, this is um, from the EPI, the Economic Policy Institute. Um, it was a blog post they put out a few days ago. There's a whole study attached to it. Wage growth has been dampening inflation all along. Wait a second. I thought wages were what was causing inflation. Nominal wage growth has been fast over the past year relative to the past few decades. And just as a side note, remember that what has been happening over the past few decades has effectively been wage cuts for workers because inflation has outpaced any kind of wage growth that we've seen. So yes, we saw a slight uptick in wages over the past uh, few years, but relative to inflation, it's a nothing burger. It has lagged far behind inflation, meaning that labor costs are dampening, not amplifying price pressures. Now, what does that mean? What they're saying there is that wages, since wages have been rising a little bit, it has been making the inflation crisis that is experienced by workers a little bit less harsh, right? So if like your wage was a straight $10 now and $20 worth of good, um, $20 worth of goods, four years ago is now effectively $25, $26 for you, you would have seen a significant loss in your purchasing power because of inflation. And what they're saying here is like, okay, well, this, you know, your wage might have gone up to $12 an hour. So you're making a little bit more, but it's not enough to make up for the loss in inflation over the past few years. So you're a little bit better off as a purchaser, um, but certainly um, are not where you should be and also are not the cause of inflation. The cause of inflation has been corporate profit, corporate greed, and inequality. Look at just, I, I've made this point time and time again um, on the program, but just look at what the oil and gas industry is doing right now. Drop climate change for a second. Just notice prices are extremely high on gasoline, something that everybody needs to, needs to get around in the society. And the oil companies, they're not investing in production. They are taking the spoils from the high prices of oil and gas, and they are giving them to their shareholders, right? That's the kind of stuff that drives up inflation, especially in a society as unequal as the United States, where the ability to save money, to have money that you just sort of sock away and you're not using on your basic expenses on a, on a daily, weekly basis is an extreme privilege. And all of those people being able to hoard more and more wealth over the past few years, as you have seen corporate profits grow, as you have seen the ability to make a lot of money on speculation grow, that drives inflation much more than somebody seeing a paltry hourly wage increase. And what we're seeing is actually, thank God that we've seen wages increase ever so slightly over the past couple of years because the inflation crisis, which is already bad, would have been so much worse today if it hadn't been that case. So, yeah, you're muted, Matt. Um, I'll let you continue. And then I got a, a yeah, thought experiment about what this, what these people represent, these technocrats that just well, are trying to. Why don't you first? Because we're going to go to Biden. So, yeah, I mean, the, you know, we th think about like the way that we're taught American history and the mythologized way of like the House of Burgesses and it's the Enlightenment and we get together to deliberate ideas and that's what leads to the Senate and the greatest deliberative body on <laughs> earth and stuff like that. But what the House of Burgesses was, was a way for a bunch of slave owners to uh, come together and collectively figure out how to manage their slaves and uh, also like uh, 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 come together and uh, um, um, uh, sort of... Uh, 
demand stuff of the governor's, the royal governor's council. But anyway, so like th- this is these guys coming out and saying, "Look, we've crunched the numbers, and workers just got to take less." Is like basically if Thomas Jefferson and uh, George Washington came down from Monticello and Mount Vernon, and we're like, "Look, guys." slaves i'm saying Mm -hmm. um gonna be less food for you gonna be a lot less and this is just how it has to be in order uh, meanwhile look at the fucking mansions they come out of Mm -hmm. like look at all this stuff look at all the amount of the of money that was shoveled to corporations fork it up that's that's the the question is like if someone's got to uh uh got to pay here it's the profiteers (laughs) Right. And, and when have they ever in our fucking lifetimes been made to be the ones to sacrifice? Uh, and like the worst that this, if, if this gets bad, if the economy really and they start to put the screws to people, that's what you need to tell them is when the mm-hmm. last time you saw Jeff Bezos or any one of these motherfuckers sacrifice anything, despite everything going on in the world. It's just up and up. The line goes up for those guys. They're fucking to the moon, literally. And meanwhile, mm-hmm. what's what, see, what you, you can't get a raise. You can't get you, or you get a raise that's a fraction of the cent. Meanwhile, like like food goes up like multiples, ridiculous. Well, you got to raise a hard fought raise after years of getting it, and see it erased by inflation, right? Yeah. Um, which is the going to be the experience for many many workers if people like Powell get their way. So we just broke down these. This isn't even just me speculating at this point. I hope that people trust me on things at at this point. But this one's very clear. Powell says, goal of Federal Reserve, get wages down. We need to get the wages down. That's the big problem. If right? Trump if if Trump said that, the the um, Occupy Democrats would be like, oh my God, yeah. Rich Reed, if you think Donald Trump is a psychopath for saying this. Well, let's 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 uh, pull up um, the solution to Trump here, Matt. Joe Biden. This is what Joe Biden's uh, response was. This is a couple of days ago. And he said other things to this effect uh, recently. I will say. I don't have a lot of expectations for Biden, but when I was finding this the, the other day for the segment, my mouth, my jaw really was really on the floor uh, because this is just the height of irresponsibility. This is Joe Biden. My plan to tackle inflation is simple. Let the Fed do its job. Lower everyday costs for Americans. Doesn't mean anything what he's saying right there. Um, keep reducing what, the deficit. What, are you deficit. fucking Walmart? Like- <laughs> yeah, exactly. He should be. Though. Like, take over. Yeah, right. and, uh, yeah. Keep reducing the deficit. By taking these steps and with Congress taking action, we can build a sustained recovery that benefits all Americans. And let's just start with the easy one here, um, which is Biden had a, a program. A program was put into place that had a massive impact in millions of Americans' lives. You know, we talk about what Lula did um, for hunger in Brazil, what the child tax credit did. Um, for millions of American families was nothing short of exceptional. It changed people's lives. It allowed people who are struggling to be able to afford food for their children, be able to find clothing for them. Remember, you know, all these times people talk about how rich America is, you know, and I think sometimes, you know, people get a little bit worked up um, with that and don't pay attention to the fact that, you know, something like 20% of Americans have a difficult time putting food on the table let alone healthy food, anything like that, just basic sustenance to maintain their life on the table. There's an extreme poverty in this country. And the child tax credit was not perfect. It should have been much more generous and should have been permanent, um, but it was effective. This just last week, nearly half of families with kids can no longer afford enough food five months after the child tax credit ended. I'll read that again. Nearly half of families with kids can no longer afford enough food for five months after, um, f- sorry, enough food five months after child tax credit ended. This is in the wealthiest country of the, of the world, and this is the game that they're playing with the next generation of children, right? So talking about Biden right here, um, you know what he's saying, what he wants to do for the everyday average American. There, the first thing that should be done is should be the expansion of the child tax credit. But I want to go beyond that. Because this first bit, what Biden says, where he says, let the Federal Reserve do its job, is one of those things that gets the liberals so excited. They get pink in the cheeks when they hear stuff like this. It's the same thing as the cult of the Supreme Court. They love having institutions that are anti-democratic and are run by technocrats. Now, sometimes they think they get flawed, but they love the independence and the separation of these institutions from the public, right? That is one of the most dangerous things. You live in a democracy here. And you have this extremely powerful body 
that, by the way, during the pandemic, pumped trillions into the pockets of the wealthiest people in this country. Something that's not talked about enough, right? From things like PPP to just buying up corporate debt, right? You know, there's this big crisis. Oh my God, what are we going to do about student loan debt? Oh, is it fair for some students to have their debt? Blah, blah, blah. Where were they when the Federal Reserve was buying up bullshit debt uh, from corporations to keep the economy afloat in COVID-19, right? Where was the question about that? Where was the democratic debate? You see, there's a very, very different political game that the rich get to play, the monetary system, off limits, right? The actions of the Federal Reserve, off limits to politics. We can have... Um, debates that won't go anywhere about student loans. We can have debates that maybe won't go anywhere about minimum wage stuff, right? But you see where they're like, no, we won't touch this. And it's absolutely cowardly. And there's no reason um, for an institution that has as much power and effect on our lives to be separate from us. Because again, just putting on my obnoxious centrist, you know, cat for a second. Well, if you have a, you know, if you have a political federal reserve, then they're just going to do policies that might make the economy very, very weak because they're just pumping money to everybody so that they get votes, right? And that's the argument that you get against the, you know, <laughs> against having a publicly controlled Federal Reserve is that if you don't let the experts do their jobs, these things will be controlled by politics. In the same way that we say this about the Supreme Court, look at the actual history of what the Federal Reserve has done. Time and time again, in crisis moments, they pump money to the wealthy and they punish the poor. Happened with the Volcker shock in the 70s, one of the most defining moments of not just American history, by the way, um, but also global financial history. Because when Volcker rose interest rates like that, poor countries in the South saw their debt payments skyrocket and many of them had to default. Right. And that meant accepting IMF loans and more and more American involvement in the way that they run their society. Right. You saw the same thing after um, the dot com bubble. And you certainly saw it after the financial crisis here. The Federal Reserve's pipes go one way. They go in the pocketbooks of the rich and powerful of this society. Right. So why do you think what world do you live in? I'm sorry, friend, at this point where you think an absence of democracy from these kind of institutions is somehow going to help them run for everyday people better for everyday people. You have your head in the sand. An absence of democracy only benefits one group, the powerful. And Biden's cowardice on this is absolutely despicable. And the reason that he's making such a big show of grandstanding about this is because Trump mentioned one time that he just wanted to put pressure on the Federal Reserve to keep interest rates low, right? Just put pressure. I think you should actually go a hell of a lot further on these things. But Biden's unwilling to even push and say, you know what, this is unhelpful. This is very dangerous. Biden will get steamrolled by these people and they will punish American workers um, and the effects will be felt for generations. Yeah, I mean, along with like the parliamentarian, it's another yeah. sort of uh, um, invented obstacle uh, to, that they can, we just have to consult the oracle. And the Oracle says, no, again, damn it. This fucking Oracle is like 99 and 0 and deciding for moneyed interests. It's really. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe next time I'll look out for us. Yeah. And we should definitely do a lot more on the Fed. I think there's a lot of confusion as to how it functions, what powers it has for people. We talked about this a little bit actually with Brett Scott. There's a big reason that Bitcoin and libertarians are very effective. You know, it's funny, like. Um, libertarians always say end the Fed, end the Fed. I actually very much disagree with that. It's very important to have an institution like that that can put liquidity um, into the system in a moment of crisis. That is an important social function. The Federal Reserve does do that, but the, th the important thing is where that liquidity goes, and it goes to benefit a s small group of people. So libertarians who are like, oh, we hate the Fed, that's BS. A central bank is a helpful thing in a society. The problem is not its existence. Right. But it's separation from the public sphere. And it was when we were talking with Brett Scott, like a lot of times people, because of the confusion about the Federal Reserve, you know, become very attracted to these kind of, you know, weirdo right wing libertarian philosophies because there's a lot of confusion on that. Anyway, long winded yeah. thing to say we should do more on the Federal Reserve in the future. Um, but I just wanted to do a quick callback to what we opened with um, talk about mobile homes in this country. The cr housing crisis is a crisis of one, the federal government's failure to do housing policy. Um, but also the inability and also sometimes purposeful, purposeful failure of local localities and state governments for being able to do something about this. The Federal Reserve tomorrow could set up an institution 
that basically lend out money at very, very low interest rates, or maybe even a negative interest rate if you really want to spur things up, to communities who are living in mobile home parks to buy those from the private owners and to make those into publicly owned, cooperatively owned um, parks. To be able to push back on the squeeze that all those people are facing, give those people the security, and to give more and more people the right to housing in this country. And you could expand that model to apartments, to houses, to a lot of other things too. But there is a lot that we could do with a democratically run central bank or federal reserve um, that we're not doing. And Biden, I'd never had high hopes from people who might not be familiar with my work. You know, don't get me wrong here. But Biden truly is not only missing the moment, but he's actually lying down when really nefarious forces are coming for the wallets of everyday working people in this country. Yeah. Well, um, we got uh, we got more to come. In a second, we're going to be joined by Kurt uh, Hackbarth and talk about another one of Biden's failures, uh, this time on the international scale. And then reminding folks who just joined us all summer long, not all summer long, all June long, we're doing our summer streams. We're making the post games public. Those will be over at twitch.tv slash left reckoning. Join us immediately after uh, the show ends, probably going to be around 830 Central, 930 Eastern for our live stream with Ben Burgess. We'll be taking questions from the chat. We'll be taking voicemails. Ben and I are going to be doing a quick debate on Bernie 2024. Uh, we're doing a visit from the Hamburglar, um, <laughs> even Crowder. I'm trying to remember the other folks. we got a hell of a lot coming for y'all in the post yeah. game too. So that's public at, on twitch.tv slash left reckoning. But always, if you want to support the show, join us at patreon.com slash left reckoning. If you don't want to support Amazon by supporting us via Twitch, you know, jump over on patreon.com slash left reckoning. All the support means so much to help us grow the show and uh, reach a larger audience. Absolutely. All right, folks. See you on the other side of uh, Kurt. Uh, and uh, yeah, stay, stay freebies. Stay around for summer, summer streams. That's what it summer was. streams. <laughs> All right, uh, welcome back, Left Reckoners. Uh, we're very excited to be joined uh, this evening by uh, Kurt Hackbarth, uh, who is a journalist out of Mexico. You can read their uh, work in many publications, including Jackman Magazine. How's it going, Kurt? Great, guys. <clears throat> Thanks for having me today. Well, this is a this is a big topic here. So, as we're speaking, um, the Summit of the Americas is ongoing, um, but this you know very large summit, supposedly of all the countries in the Americas. Um, has had some notable absences, notably uh, the president of Mexico, along with the uh, president of, uh, of of Bolivia as well. Could you just give people who might not be familiar with this event um, an idea of what the Summit of the Americas is, and then we can get to some of the reasons why there are these notable absences this year? Sure. So um, the, the Summit of the Americas is a, a summit of all the countries of the Americas, <clears throat> which actually begins... Uh, in 1994, so it's actually a fairly recent, um, fairly recent thing, uh, and it grows out of um, the Organization of American States. We have to know exactly what the Organization of American States is, right? It's uh, a Washington, mostly Washington financed, with its headquarters in Washington, Cold War organization, which is basically Washington's way of ensuring its hegemony <clears throat> over the entire continent, right? Um, you know, this is the organization that expelled Cuba as soon as the Castro took over, but had no problem with Pinochet in Chile, had no problem with Videla in Argentina, uh, had no problem with any of the dictatorships uh, financed and, and stimulated by the, by the United States across the decades. And, and as we saw in 2019, um, the head of the uh, Organization of American States, uh, Luis Almagro, was basically the one that um, provoked the coup in, in Bolivia, right? Mm -hmm. That overthrow mm -hmm. um, Evo Morales there by questioning the election results, which then turned out to be totally false, an absolute and total fabrication, right? But uh, there was Almagro uh, leading the charge on that. Um, and I don't know if you saw that Almagro's event in the Summit of the Americas mm -hmm. was interrupted, was interrupted by a very brave young guy who told Almagro his stuff uh, and went on for several minutes in very great detail before he was thrown out. 
Um, it's on my um, it's on my Twitter feed, and I'm sure a lot of other Twitter feeds. But if you you know get a chance, watch that because Almagro was um, taken to task as as he deserved to be. The Summit of the Americas is within the framework of the OAS, mm -hmm. right? Which a lot of people in Latin America want to throw out, get rid of, right? For obvious reasons. You know, it's it's an organization whose main function is to ensure American U.S. hegemony uh, throughout the continent. Now, what are the Summit of the Americas? The Summit of the Americas um, began in 1994, right in the aftermath of NAFTA. Um, and the whole idea of the Summit of the Americas was to extend a free trade, a free trade agreement to the entire continent, right, of the Americas, right? This was the FTAA, the Free Trade Agreement of the Americas. That's the real reason for being for the Summit of the Americas, right? It wasn't to bring countries together. Or it wasn't, you know, a lot of warm and fuzzy stuff. The idea was to impose a continent-wide free trade agreement, the FTAA, and that was its reason for being. So remember in this, um, the beginning of the ALT movement, right, in 1999, the battle for Seattle, uh, and then 2001, um, the Summit of the Americas meeting in Quebec, there were fierce protests, very heavily repressed. You know, some of us who are old enough, you know, remember those. I mean, those were um, between Seattle and Quebec. That was the, um, those were the, can you say it, the um, standard bearers of that, of the, of the alt um, anti-globalization movement of that time. And they worked in the sense of in the, in the 20, in the 2005, um, meeting of the Summit of the Americas and Rio de la Plata with a lot of the pink tide governments that were then in place, right? Uh, they scuttled the FTAA. They won, mm -hmm. right? Um, so then the United States and Canada were then, you know, reduced to um, doing country by country um, free trade agreements, right? Um, Mexico, they already had, they did Costa Rica, they did Peru, they did a bunch, right? And they're still trying to go ahead with that. So, you know, we, we shouldn't kid ourselves that the Summit of the Americas has, has, has never been for any uh, good reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Americas is about continent-wide free trade. Right? And free trade, of course, in, you know, we know what free trade implies. You know, yeah. we've talked, you know, we've well, it's been, yeah, it's beneficial for, <laughs> for a few yeah. and horrible for the many. Um, well, th but this one has been an interesting one just because there has been significant pushback, as we noted at the top here. Um, you know, there have been significant countries who have said that they aren't going to attend. And this is in protest uh, to the United States refusing to invite um, Cuba, Venezuela um, and Nicaragua to the um, to the event. Right. And it's a quite embarrassing moment, I would argue, for Biden, because, you know, despite all of the kind of presentation that he's put forward about how he's going to relate to the other countries in the Americas, <laughs> Really, one of the keynote moments of this event is going to be him uh, hanging out with clown fascist uh, Bolsonaro. Exactly um, right. 
But uh, before we get into all of that, I just want to put this in his own uh, words, because I think for people who don't speak Spanish, they might not realize how funny uh, Omlo can be. And this is Omlo speaking translated courtesy of Al Jazeera um, on uh, on Biden's exclusion of certain countries uh, from the Summit of the Americas. But less than a week before President Joe Biden is supposed to host his regional peers in Los Angeles, it's still unclear who will turn up. Mexico took the lead by threatening to boycott the summit after Biden decided to exclude Cuba, Nicaragua and Venezuela, arguing they don't meet the required democratic credentials. No one has the right to exclude anyone. How can you call it a summit of the Americas? Where are the excluded countries from? Another continent? Another galaxy? Another planet? I mean, I think it's a very basic point, but it's a very good one, right? Indeed, yeah. And I quoted that in my Jacobin piece uh, as well. Um, because they're excluding countries from the Americas, at the same time, they're inviting Spain. Yes. As an observer, <clears throat> right? Um, Spain, the country that colonized the countries that they're excluding, is there as an observer, right? And when you say Spain, what you really mean is uh, Iberdrola. Uh, Repsol, right, and Naturdi. You mean all of these, you know, large energy uh, companies um, that are, you know, uh, right at this moment attempting to dominate the energy market in Mexico and other countries in Latin America uh, and have, you know, screwed the Spanish consumer to the point of, you know, absolute desperation, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you mean when you're inviting Spain. You're inviting those, con you're inviting those companies. Um, so, yeah, let's go back a second, right? Mm -hmm. um, so at the beginning of, of last month, right, Brian Nichols from the State Department goes on Colombian television, you know, with a smile on his face and says, um, you know, they ask what countries are going to be in invited. And he says, you know, Cuba, Nicaragua, right, Venezuela don't meet the standards of the Inter-American Charter, so they're not going to be invited. Right? Now, I think they were totally unprepared for the reaction they got. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know, you know, who they've got in the State Department, but it started off with the the Caribbean countries, the CARICOM countries that said they're all Americas. Then by May 5th, AMLO said, if everybody's not invited, we're, you know, we're not going to go. He's sending his foreign minister, Marcelo Ebrard, because, you know, as the CARICOM country said, this is a summit of the Americas. The United States doesn't get to choose who's invited and who's not. So that sets off this chain reaction, right? Luis Arce of Bolivia, Estejumina Castro of Honduras, two countries that have suffered three U.S.-sponsored coups very recently, right? Then Bolsonaro flirted with not going, but he is going, right? Jim mm -hmm. um, uh, from 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 Guatemala, right, et cetera. What was uh, Bolsonaro, what was his rationale for not going going to be? He never even said. He never said. Um, basically, I think, you know, it's a pro-Trump, Steve Bannon kind of thing that we're going to try to embarrass Biden, right? Okay, gotcha. There was, there was, you know, there was, you know, nothing. He never articulated why because he doesn't really articulate anything. You know, it, just, it, it was just a posture. Well, he was, he was, he was probably mad as our, our friends at Brazil Wire pointed out uh, today <laughs> um, that you know there were those leaked um, documents that the CIA had basically warned Bolsonaro that the United States will not tolerate him messing around with the elections in, in Brazil. So he's probably upset about that. Um, I mean, which is just the irony here, of course, is that, you know, here's somebody who like our own government and our government is not benevolent, don't get me wrong here, but are worried that he might start trying to mess around with the elections in Brazil, the upcoming elections in Brazil, right. um, but are saying, well, that's a democratic country, but Venezuela and Cuba, you know, countries where people win elections, uh, we're not going to include those. And how about how about El Salvador, right? Mm -hmm. Bukele right now is crossing how many people in jail, right? Violations of human rights left and right. I mean, right? His, mm -hmm. his, his so-called war on the gangs. But he's fine. He's fine, right? There's absolutely no logic to this. There's no logic to this besides uh, this stupid uh, U.S. viscerality that they've never been able to overthrow the Castros, and so we're just going to keep this blockade on them forever, mm -hmm. even though it's obviously you know never worked for regime change or anything else, right? Um, and what's funny is, and this of course none of this is lost on Latin America, is as soon as Ukraine starts, mm -hmm. um, Biden sends his minions down to Venezuela to try to get some oil out of Venezuela, right? 
And then there's, oh, there's blowback in the U.S., so we can't do this. But now the U.S. is going to allow, this is according to The Hill, right, allow Venezuela to export um, its oil to, to Europe, right? Because Europe needs oil because they're trying to cut off, right, it's Russian oil, right? But of course, that oil is going to be exported through um, Italia's, Italy's company Eni and Spain's company Repsol, which are going to be the big intermediaries there and the people who make who make the money on this, right? Mm-hmm. But what a classic expression of the fact that the Monroe Doctrine has never ended. The U.S. allows <laughs> who Venezuela exports its oil to, and not even to the U.S. The thing is, with U.S. sanctions, it's not just the U.S. It's any other country that wants to do business with a country that's sanctioned by the U.S. And see, the U.S. sanctions, the idea is that they're universal, they're galactic, right? Nobody can do business with a sanctioned country uh, by the U.S. unless the U.S. allows it. So at the same time as the U.S. is now clearly, obviously doing business with Maduro Mm -hmm. to sell oil to Europe, they're still recognizing Guaido as president and not allowing Maduro to go or anybody from Venezuela to go to the Southern Americas. So it's just a, just a stupid, childish, hypocritical game that they're playing that you can't go to the summit. Oh, but we need your oil, mm-hmm. but we can't import your oil because Bob Menendez doesn't want it. So you can send it to Europe. And I it, mean, sorry, Matt, go ahead. I, I was, I just want to comment. Like, it's amazing that the Spain detail escaped me. And it's, it's funny because you talk about the lag or the, the childish rationale, but it's also a rationale that like we talk about if you could go back in time and talk to the founding fathers or like you mm. know, statesmen of the past, it's one, like if you'd have told them like, yeah, we got this body and we're involving uh, Spain because, you know, we got some connections, but we're not including these certain countries because they're on our bad side. Those sort of folks would totally understand like, oh yes, well, that's how we always do things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Clearly. Um, <laughs> the, it really boggles the mind. And the thing is, the U.S. clearly doesn't take lightly to being, right, mm-hmm. um, countered, right? They're trying to paper it over that they're not angry at AMLO for not going, but they very obviously are. So you've got Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio saying that uh, AMLO has ties with the narco, right? No evidence. No, I'm just they're, just they're just saying it because they're angry, right? Because Mexico isn't towing their line, right? Now, it's very funny that Mexico just had gubernatorial elections on Sunday, and the main line of the opposition the week before was, guess what? AMLO has ties with the narco. Because the U.S. right and the Mexican right, through the think tanks and through the institutes, we talked about this on the program, which we invited me on the last time, they they line up their messaging. So if you get it from the states, you're going to get it from the Mexican right here. Now, it didn't work. AMLO's party, Morena, won four of the six governorships that were up for grabs. So... Their little, their little line bombed. But you can see now that this is this is where it's going, right? AMLO is a narco government. He's losing control of the country. Uh, 30 to 35 percent of the country is out of control of the government. You've got Glenn Van Herc from the U.S. Northern Command who is saying the exact same thing, right? And AMLO actually responded to that uh, in his press conference this morning, saying he's either uninformed or it's just openly bad faith, right? But this is this is this is this is what you face when you when you counter. Um, Uncle Sam, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now, AMLO's going to go up there in July to visit Biden, and they've got you know a mutual agenda to work out. So I think, in the large scheme of things, you know the relationship will continue. But you'll still get you know all of these attempts to undermine anyone who questions the line, and it's a line that wasn't even coherent. Mm-hmm. You've got Brian Nichols saying one thing right, back in April, and the next day, Jen Psaki in the, in the um, press conference saying, oh, the, uh, the invitations haven't been sent out yet. We don't know who's going to be invited yet. And they had, didn't even send out the invitations until, what, two or three days before the summit? Mm-hmm. Who's running the State Department? I check your spam Who's folders. <laughs> no, no, I mean, and, like, I'm going to play this clip uh, here uh, right quick for y'all because it does seem that, like, this is certainly flub, of course, but it just shows the level of priority that you're getting within like the operation of, of the U.S. government. This is the new White House press secretary um, responding to a question about why Bolsonaro, of, of all people, um, right. you know, is there and is also making very wild claims internally in Brazil 
um, about how he got all these concessions uh, from Biden regarding the Amazon, etc. But let's I'll, I'll play this clip right here for y'all. It's not a different subject from the president's meeting with uh, President Bolsonaro of, of Brazil. Uh, he, he's reporting that uh, the Brazilian government, President Bolsonaro, wanted specific concessions from the president for, the, for that meeting that they, and for his attendance at the Summit of the Americas, that he wouldn't bring up uh, Bolsonaro's casting doubts about Brazil's election, election system, as well as uh, uh, environmental concerns in the Amazon. Can you confirm that report? I, I cannot confirm that report. The president is um, is is looking forward to leaving tomorrow uh, to head to the summit. That clearly that we're uh, that we are hosting. Um, I can say this: that the United States continues to recognize um, Juan Gu uh, Guado as the interim president of Venezuela. That said, while the interim government was uh, was not invited uh, to participate in the main summit, they are welcome to participate in all three stakeholder forums and other events. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, well, at least they can participate in the stakeholder forums. Well, so that <laughs> well, I will say this, like Matt and I, um, you know, try not to be too cynical when we watch these things. Right. Um, and it took me a couple of moments to realize that I think there's actually a genuine confusion about who Bolsonaro is and who the president of Venezuela is there. I mean, certainly a lot of confusion if you're talking about Guaido. Um, but, you know, bringing up the, the concerns about Venezuela in response to the question about Bolsonaro saying that he got secret concessions from the Biden administration is just showing that even at the top of, of the system here, there it's, it's just completely incoherent and, and a real dumpster fire of, of an event so far. You know, that's it. And none of this is lost on Latin America, that they don't even seem to know the geography. Mm -hmm. They don't even seem to know who's who, right? As you, as you very well said, the question was about Brazil. And they wound up talking about Venezuela and pronouncing the guy's name wrong. <laughs> you know, the puppet who now they've now tossed out, right? Because he's no longer useful. To, he's no longer their useful mm -hmm. idiot, right? None of this is lost on them. <clears throat> and I think it's important to point out, right, that Cuba already went to the Summit of the Americas in 2015, mm -hmm. right, with the Obama's opening there, the semi-opening. At the 2015 summit, Cuba was there, Nicaragua was there, and Venezuela was there, right? At the last one in 2019, uh, Cuba was there again, right, their foreign minister. Venezuela was there again, right, foreign minister. Nicaragua was there. It's all the countries were represented, right? So this year's summit is not only a step backward compared to the Obama years, it's a step backward even compared to the miserably low bar that Trump left, because Trump mm -hmm. boycotted the summit, but and he sent Pence, but all the countries were there. This year, not even that, <clears throat> because Biden is unpopular, because the midterm elections are up, because Bob Menendez is head of the Senate Foreign, the Foreign Affairs Committee, because right, a, a handful of people in, in, in Miami, um, think that they can talk in the name of all of the Cuban Americans in the country, right? Or all the Venezuelan Americans uh, in the country, right? And dictate the U.S. foreign policy um, so that it continues to be this Cold War relic in 2022, right? And I think it's also not lost on Latin America that the United States is now pouring billions into Ukraine. Billions, billions, 40 billion, what else? And that, that gets passed in five minutes. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Billions. AMLO has asked for a program for Central America, which will extend two of his more popular social programs into the Central America, right? One of them is an apprenticeship program for young people who don't have studies or work to get apprenticeships and start getting involved in, in, in work and, uh, and learning skills. And another one is a tree planting program, an environmental tree planting program, right? Sembrando Vida, right? All of these are targeted at um, reducing immigration. Mm -hmm. Right and and creating the conditions for people to be able to um, people don't want to immigrate. It's, <laughs> people don't want to immigrate. It's 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 forced upon them. Those programs would cost a fraction of what the U.S. is throwing in bushelfuls. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing, zero, right? Squat, right? because Latin America isn't important to the United States except as except as the country where they can talk about, you know, Guado and get the names wrong and not even care because it's their backyard. Who cares? Mm -hmm. Right. One thing is to keep Russia out and keep China out. Right. Mm -hmm. And not do anything there of any good service, but just keep other foreign powers out. Right. 
um, and then use immigration as a political football, because they're obviously not interested in really stopping immigration in any meaningful sense, besides that doesn't involve militarization, military contracts, or, you know, neoliberal contracts to companies in those areas, right? That's it. And these companies, these countries realize that, you know, even if the United States doesn't know who they are or where they are or, you know, who their leaders are, the countries down here know exactly what the American posture is. Mm. And so why would they want to go to the summit? What's in it for them? Nothing. There's nothing in it for them. And, you know, after a while, <laughs> people realize this. Mm -hmm. Well, totally. And like, it just, uh, just as a reminder for folks too, that on top of all the things that, you know, Kurt outlined as to the real um, reason for the summer of the Americas in general, one of the big things that Biden at least has been sort of promoting is that like, this is going to be a moment to talk about migration to come up to, a, you know, a solution uh, mm -hmm. to that quote unquote mm -hmm. uh, problem. And, you know, Mexico not participating is a huge blow, um, you know, to whatever Biden's kind of plans were there. And what I suspect is a lot of countries, Mexico included, don't want to get roped into a summit, which is being manipulated for United States domestic interests. Mm -hmm. They don't want to get roped into, you know, having to get wrapped into the American line on, on immigration, right? And they don't want to get roped into, you know, the American line on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Because in the large sense, Latin America has been, you know, neutral on the Ukraine issue. <clears throat> They've condemned the invasion, but they're not playing ball with the sanctions, and they're not going along with uh, militarizing <clears throat> militarizing Ukraine, and not with this ludicrous uh, idea of sending long-range missiles and very provocative you know, measures, right? So why would they want to get wrapped into the Ukraine? Why would they want to get wrapped into the U.S. discourse on, on migration or get used for that, right? There's, I think there's any faith that these things are going to be discussed in any bilateral manner right mm -hmm. but that it's going to be used as look what you know this for um the november elections totally and um before we you know start to talk about the the international aspect here i just wanted to you know note for people that like amlo has been very on point um about the real <laughs> the real desires for this uh, summit um <laughs> particularly why certain countries are being excluded it's the domestic focus for biden mm -hmm. um this is uh Omlo blamed Senator Bob Menendez from New Jersey, Democrat from New Jersey today for allegedly threatening Biden uh, to stop voting with the Democratic majority if Cuba was invited to the Summit of the Americas. Omlo was originally asked about Marco Rubio, uh, Republican of Florida, but ended up talking about Menendez and Ted Cruz from Texas. Um, Omlo was asked about a tweet yesterday by Marco Rubio lambasting him for supposedly turning over sections of Mexico to the drug cartels, as you were just noting. Uh, Omlo got mixed up today and insisted that one saying that was, one was not Rubio, but his uh, colleague Ted Cruz. That's not <laughs> as much important. But, um, you know, this this there is an understanding, as you were noting, that, like, you know, this is less about finding solutions or building continental solidarity or anything like that. But Biden mm -hmm. trying to find a cheap way because he doesn't care too much about these countries to curry favor with members of his own party, for God's sakes. Um, and also to maybe, you know, be a little bit of a shield from potential Republican attacks, which, by the way, are coming regardless of what Biden does here. Right. And I think, you know, to, to the point about the tweet, I think Ted Cruz has said something about that in the past, maybe not mm -hmm. immediately, about, you know, Okay, I'm just going to say I'm not like too worked up about the president mm -hmm. of Mexico keeping mm -hmm. up to date on what Republican senators <laughs> tweeting what every <laughs> single day. Yeah, I like but. it. <laughs> and, you know, I think this is par for the course for Biden as well, mm -hmm. right? He can't stand up to anybody. You know, this is the guy who was supposedly going to be the great negotiator, right? Mm -hmm. That was supposedly Biden's great point, that he could negotiate things and get things passed and get – you know, get agreements made, right? Because he'd been in the Senate since 1973. Mm -hmm. What it turns out is Biden's, he's in the State Department, turns and runs at the first sign of any um, opposition, right? Mm -hmm. Who's Menendez? I mean, Menendez is admired in his own corruption scandal, right? Mm -hmm. Barely won re-election in New Jersey. Um, I, th I really think that if they had invited every country, there would have been a couple of days of hissy fits, and then everybody would have forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, and they would have moved on to the next thing. <clears throat> but because of the way, this ham-fisted way of handling the whole thing, and this yes, no, 
Yes, no. We're going to invite, we're not going to invite. We're going to invite, the invitations haven't been sent out yet, but no, but yes, but no. It, it amplified the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it turned it into what it became, which is, you know, <clears throat> a public relations disaster for Latin America and a stupid and a stupid way to run any kind of international summit. And it, it just, it didn't have to, <laughs> it didn't have to be this way. I mean, you know. Well yeah, I mean, I'm glad you brought up what uh, AMLO is like proposing those sort of policies, <laughs> the reforestation and the welfare policies, like, mm -hmm. because that like, we're so caught up in this, like between Stephen Miller and Joe Biden immigration debate, where it's like taking immigration seriously in this country means treating it, like you said, as a political football, or an opportunity for giant contracts to like grifting mm -hmm. uh, security contractors and exactly. there's actual things that could be done that make people's lives across like the couple the various continents uh uh happier where they are and more safe where they are and we just don't make time for that that's exactly right and i'm let's propose those those plans and there are others but the whole paradigm of the u.s approach to latin america and, and Joe Biden has a lot to do with that. Joe Biden was the author of the Plan Colombia. Just look at how Colombia has been devastated mm -hmm. by um, the, the militarization of that, of that country and the displacement of peoples and the disappearance of peoples. Right? Uh, it, it's a tragedy that I think most Americans don't even have the, the, the first grasp of how that country has, has suffered. Now they're on the verge of maybe electing their first uh, Senate left president ever, mm -hmm. ever. Right, and then you can see what he's up against. Right in the second round, Petro. Um, Joe Biden was 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 behind the plan. You know, the Obama plan for for, for Central America, which in a very large sense replicated the, the Columbia plan, because that's all they know. That's all these people know. <clears throat> mm -hmm. They think drugs. They think militarization. They think they see drugs. They think police. Just like Biden wants to increase policing in the U.S. That's all they know. And they're obviously unwilling to change, no matter how many shootings there are in the states, no matter how much immigration there is in Latin America, no matter how much you know, devastation there's been, they won't change because that's it. That's the model. And that model also happens to benefit arms manufacturers. It also you know, benefits um, all kinds of uh, interests in these countries uh, that you know can get in there and, and, and prey on natural resources, uh, directly or indirectly. So they've got now a model in there that is just too too locked in for them to change. Um, and and I mean, so you see them spinning wheels on this, spinning wheels on this, that's all. Yeah, I mean, look at the incentives. You're a yeah. company with contracts at the border. Mm -hmm. uh, is it the incentive of that sort of apparatus to have it where you aren't detaining people and there's no need for you there anymore, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Obviously not. That's right. And, you know, you, uh, we saw how, when the border was, you know, was militarized, all of these contracts for spyware and, you know, these Israeli contracts for, you know, because they're masters at this, of, uh, you know, spying people at the border, all of this stuff, the digital electronic border, right? Um, all of the contracts for kids in cages on one side, you know, all of this stuff. It's uh, the private prison system. Um, AMLO is actually eliminating the private prison system in Mexico. Nice. Interesting, right? Yeah. Uh, all of the, the, the incentives for um, nabbing immigrants and then basically having them work for slaves until you deport them. Mm -hmm. um, I've interviewed people in Tijuana and the refugees when they just gotten back. He said they had us working for a dollar, you know, dollar or whatever, an hour, um, <clears throat> basically slave labor, right? in these detention centers before we were sent back to Mexico. So you've got people basically working as slaves in these detention centers. Um, th all of this is the incentive for the system that's in place now to continue. There's absolutely no incentive for that to change to anything more humane because people mm -hmm. lose money. And until you see some shift in that paradigm, there's absolutely no point in the summits. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's no point in the summit of the Americas anyway. I think, you know, Latin America and the Caribbean should form their own organization, which they're trying to do with the CELAC, right, and trying to dump the OAS, because I think it's just the interests of Latin America and the Caribbean are in, incompatible with the United States and Canada on a governmental level, not on mm -hmm. a popular level, not in a trade union level, not in a grassroots level. I'm talking about the governmental level. There's no point in having these, you know, the U.S. and Canada together with Latin America and one organization. Yeah, well, no before... 
before we go and take a quick visit to to Miami, um, I did want to sort of mm -hmm. ask you on this. Um, you know, this is what uh, Eva Morales uh, said on this. The latest version of the misnamed Summit of the Americas is born dead by the absence of several brother presidents who reject the arbitrary and unilateral exclusion of Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua by the United States. And remember that, you know, a lot of times when people talk about the coup that happened in Bolivia, there's a lot of focus on lithium. And I don't, I'm not saying that that's not a interest um, of, you know, of, of capital. We certainly saw Elon Musk tweeting things along those lines. Um, but what the U.S. was really afraid of was MAS and was the movement um, that Morales, along with members of other countries, was starting to build, as you were noting, mm -hmm. of a kind of different center of power right. um, mm -hmm. for the region. And, you know, this, as you were noting earlier, it's like this seems to have been a real, you know, shot in the foot uh, for Biden because it made something that a lot of people, they sort of know what it is and they don't really care too much about the summit of the Americas um, into a very, very big deal. And I'd just be curious um, on, on your perspective, sort of being in Mexico and also paying attention to politics and events um, around uh, the, the Americas, if you feel um, like this might be a moment of a shift, right? We've seen, for example, AMLO putting pressure not just on Biden for this event, but calling the United States policies uh, around Cuba genocidal, right? Okay. I mean, these are significant, yeah. significant moves. And as you were noting in Colombia, potential of a, of a center left president, hopefully Lula is able to defeat Bolsonaro in, in, in Brazil. I mean, how would you sort of categorize um, the state of any kind of shift coming out of this? Well, I'm cautiously optimistic on that. <clears throat> as, you, as you said, um, the Summit of the Americas seems to have sparked something. Mm -hmm. right? um, you know, when, when Brian Nichols first came out with his, you know, with his line, the first line came from the Caribbean. You didn't expect that. And then AMLO and then Bolivia, Honduras, and, 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 and Musk. Mm -hmm. And even the countries that are attending, like uh, Chile with Boric, right, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and Argentina, after Fernandez, they're going, but they're going under protest. They agree with what AMLO said, mm -hmm. right? They, you know, they're going, but, right? So this is a almost, you know, very much a continent-wide thing. Now, we seem to be in a moment where there's a second pink tide in Latin America, right? Sparked by Mexico in 2018. And now we have, you know, Honduras, we have Chile, we have Argentina. Uh, Colombia is neck and neck. So that's a very close one to watch. <clears throat> Uh, Lula's looking good uh, in, in Brazil coming up. Um, so you could have a point where the largest, all the major powers in Latin America in the next two months, in the best scenario, are in control of center-left governments. Now, the last time that happened, you had some very interesting experiments in multilateral cooperation. You had the ALBA, right, mm -hmm. countries. You had the UNASUR uh, countries. Now, once the pink way, pink tide, you know, kind of, receded and a series of right-wing governments entered in in the mid-teens, those projects were kind of stunted. And you had the counter, the counter efforts like the Lima group sponsored by Obama, you know, right-wing governments in the region and such. So the question is now is, will the Summit of the Americas debacle have proven to be strong enough to get a second wave going of regional multilateral cooperation? <laughs> Uh, the CELAC summit last year was promising. All the countries in Latin America uh, went, you know, even Venezuela, and they were there, and Cuba, and they were, you know, de debating and arguing back and forth, but at least they were all at the same table. <laughs> um, the problem is there's a huge amount of pressure there, a huge amount of pressure. At that time at the CELAC conference, AMLA was saying, we need like a European Union of Latin America and the Caribbean. <laughs> A European, and now the European Union is a very debatable model for the left. Mm -hmm. It's hardly a left model to emulate at all. But this was what he was saying at the time. But then under very obvious pressure, he began to kind of pivot and began to say, oh, we need a model of all of the Americas, of the United States and Canada, as well as Latin America to you know, face the threats of China. And I think that would be <clears throat> very, very problematic. Right? And that's the line that AMLO continues to maintain mm -hmm. um, to this day, right, under, I think, um, some very clear pressure. So I think the the jury is out on that one. I would like to think that uh, something good is coming because just this moderate degree of cooperation between Latin American and Caribbean countries saying, you know, we're not going to the summit, look how spooked the U.S. got. Mm -hmm. 
you got Brian Nichols saying one thing, you got the State Department saying it's all Cuba, you know? You know, it's like this 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 paranoia that Cuba controls, like this tiny island of Cuba controls all of Latin America. <clears throat> and they were putting everybody up to it. Like a high school principal mentality. Like, who put you up to this? Right? So imagine if there was some more coordinated cooperation amongst all of Latin America, mm-hmm. right? That would be a very impressive and very powerful thing. And that's been what the U.S. has always attempted to avoid. One can only hope. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's important to be sober and not just say that like, this is the one moment that all this is starting to happen. But right. as I remind people, when you look at things that happen, maybe domestically in the U S it's like, it's much better to be able to talk about things that are happening than moments when sort of nothing is happening in that direction. Um, and that's certainly, um, encouraging. Um, but we're seeing, you know, a, a big pushback in the States, uh, on this. And I think, uh, while we have you here, it's always fun to go through some of these pieces and the way that Almo is being uh, presented in U.S. media. Now, typically, we like to go to the Times or these big publications, but this is public radio. It's an opinion piece uh, on Omlo, and it is just rife with these kind of presentations uh, of Omlo. Again, rem- just reminding folks that, you know, this is somebody who won with popular mandate um, in, in their initial election and then held a second election basically to check um, whether or not they, you know, the people wanted them to stay in office. And the right wing in this country has continued to demonize this person as anti democratic. I mean, this is somebody who has expanded the amount of times that people are voting right. <laughs> for, for president in their country and is also at the same time somehow de- un- undemocratic. But let's let this person, um, Tim Badgett, uh, speak for themselves. Um, this is the piece in uh, local Miami public radio online. Um, Oh, Omlo, the summit of the Americas is a warning to the buyers of Radio Mambo. And for people who aren't familiar, you know, this is sort of like one of the right wing uh, political stations, Spanish language media in, in Miami. And we'll let this we'll, we'll read some bits of the argument. But effectively, what he's trying to say is that all of these left wing leaders like Omlo and other members of uh, other people, uh, sorry, other countries um, in, in the Americas are basically making all of the stereotypes put out by this super far right organization seem to be true. (laughs) Um, So I'll just read this first bit here. It's tempting in Miami to blame the dominance of right wing Spanish language media and its disinformation on some intrinsic reactionary mania in the Cuban, Venezuela and other Latino communities. But liberals and moderates who go that route can sound as narrow minded as some of the talk show hosts they decry at outlets like Radio Bombi. A true Mambi is one of South Florida's South Florida's highest rated radio stations because it perfected the art of McCarthy's <laughs> mendacity long before Fox News ever hit cable. cable. But Mambi's uh, has had something else going for it. The fact that the Latin American left, especially in Cuba, so often can be as extremist as Mambi's on-air personalities rant that it is. Uh, that reality, in turn, helps them convince their listeners that anyone Mombi's, uh, Mombi decides is a socialista, uh, a Democratic presidential candidate, a critical journalist, a Black Lives Matter activist, is Fidel Castro in sheep's uh, clothing. Um, they, of course, call uh, Omlo here a leftist popular narcissist um, here, but let's see. Um, Populist where- narcissist. Yeah. What, it, what does that even mean? <laughs> I didn't learn that yeah. one on my five courses. Or is that some kind of uh, <laughs> picked up in a supermarket? We're yeah. wading into new new realms of political theory here, folks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's police politicians for narcissism. <laughs> okay, so so here's where it starts to get um, a little bit more exciting. Um, uh, Lopez Obrador is staying away from the summit President Biden is hosting. The reason he's protesting Biden's imminently understandable decision not to invite the repressive left wing dictatorships of Cuba, Venezuela and Nicaragua to a gathering of hemispheric uh, democracies. We already noted why that's nonsensical, especially with some of the other people that were invited. Um, but while Lopez Obrador wants you to think he's a principal liberal, he looks instead like the sort of petulant left lefty whose affronts help sell Abogado de, de Accidente adds on Miami radio. For starters, Lopez Obrador is declaring to the world that his jaded Che Guevara ideology matters more than the outrage of Cubans today being sentenced to one, two, or three decades in prison for protesting their government, or that a fifth of Venezuela's population has fled the country thanks to a socialist regime the UN has accused of crimes against humanity, or that Daniel Ortega, Nicaragua's own blood-stained leftist Cadillo, uh, won re-election 
last fall by tossing every one of his election opponents in jail for treason. Now, you're in Mexico. Would you consider uh, AMLO to be a, um, a adherent of Che Guevara ideology? No, absolutely not. <laughs> um, ab- this idea that he's been kind of absolute radical on this when he's got all of Latin America basically behind him, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what is radical about saying that every country should be invited to a summit about the Americas? <clears throat> what, is, yeah. what, what is radical about that? It's not that you're endorsing right? It's not that you're endorsing every single thing about these countries. It's that you're getting them at a table to discuss things of, you know, regional and international interest. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And it's, you know, it's interesting too, that I think people don't know much about Mexican um, foreign policy because they don't care. Mm -hmm. Right. Actually, Mexico back in the sixties was the only country to oppose the OAS is throwing Cuba out of the organization. Mexico voted no on that. I think that was 1962. Right. Um, Mexico sold discounted oil to Castro for a long time, right, before the neoliberal era came on and such. So AMLO is acting very coherently with Mexico's own tradition of foreign policy, mm-hmm. right? its own neutrality based in the Estrada doctrine and such. Right. I mean, there's 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 a long history behind this. People think that these countries just, you know, improvised because the U.S. is clearly improvising on this summit. But there's a long history behind this in in in, um, in Mexican foreign policy, and you don't have to be endorsing dictatorships to be saying that the United States' embargo on that country is genocidal, mm-hmm. is preventing country is preventing people from getting food and medicine uh, during this most the most recent pandemic. You know they couldn't even get diesel to run generators for their hospitals. Mm-hmm. So how many COVID patients died because of that embargo? Mexico was sending diesel to Cuba. Right. Does sending diesel mean that you're supporting a dictatorship? Or it's because you don't want people to die of yeah. COVID. Right. That's the you thing. Know. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no no no. I mean I I, I think that that's that's a phenomenal point, and I was just gonna um, come down this this piece a little bit here because like what's what's funny about the argument that we're getting here um, is not that you know Onlo should be care, caring about like the. Uh, the well-being of people in those countries who are being starved out by sanctions and the blockade, right? It's that almost should be worried about what is selling um, to right-wing Miami radio stations. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, I mean, the thing about that is like, there's a certain thing that comes, I think, with maturity that we've all probably realized where you think you're describing the world in a Twitter post or like a blog post, but really you look back at it and you realize you're just revealing stuff about yourself. And mm. like this guy, the way he's talking about, like he, you are just one of those right wing radio guys. You basically have their politics. The way you describe mm-hmm. like the socialista and how that's so such a, like a super bad thing. It's like, it's like, well, I really hate these guys, the reactionaries who say two plus two equals three. But there's these other equally <laughs> extreme people that say two plus two equals four. And we really have to like, they're kind of giving a lot of ammunition to the two plus two equals three people. <laughs> yeah. I think what I'm looking at in his, his press conference the other day was, was quite you know telling. He's, you know, times have moved on, but the U.S. foreign policy is still in the hands of a couple of octogenarian senators because, you know, in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Congress, people win re-election indefinitely. So they're the same people who were there during the Cold War, right? So it's the same, you know, it's the same people and it's the same mentality. So you've got one person in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. You've got a few leaders of, you know, Cuban American and Venezuelan exile communities when there are millions of people who might think differently. People in the mm-hmm. second generation, people in the third generation might think differently. And actually the Mexican American community is much bigger in the United States. That's it's so true, yeah. It's 10 times bigger, right? If, if you want to talk about that, right? Mm-hmm. What about their voices on these things, right? They only seem to care in the United States about Latino voices when they're voices that seem to um, agree with certain right-wing talking points. Then, oh, they're very caring about the Cuban American community or the Venezuelan American community. But, you know, the Mexican American community and others, not so much, right? Unless they line up with their talking points. And I think something else that's very important that I, you know, I talked about in the Jacobin pieces. Mm-hmm. Who is the U.S. to lecture on democracy? 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole other can of worms, isn't it? Two of our presidents in the last 25 years have been elected losing the popular vote. You've got gerrymandered districts. You've got block campaigns because people can spend unlimited sums of money through political action committees. You know, in the last inauguration, there was a mutiny and people were using heavy furniture to block the doors of the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. Do they think people don't see this abroad? Do they think people don't see this? That that doesn't get across, that doesn't leave the border? <clears throat> Any of this news? Totally. And like, you know, just to... <laughs> you know, be a little bit of an American on this. I think it's worthwhile to note for folks that like, okay, so some people might say, well, well, that's just how the American system works. We have the electoral college, right? But could you imagine Americans having that kind of sympathy? Like if something similar happened in another country where they're like, oh, well, that's just how their system works, right? Yes, think and be reflective about it. No, that would never happen. <laughs> they would say, they would say, well, the system doesn't make sense, which it doesn't. Um, but uh, <laughs> let me go down this a little bit because, uh, you know, Again, obviously, this is coming from a right wing perspective, but this is going to people who carry around tote bags and, you know, might like Joe Biden, you know, who listen to NPR. Right. And this is the kind of presentation of what we have been talking about now for about 40 minutes, which is a very important moment um, in, in the history of relations of the United States to the rest of the Americas, where people are saying, no, we're not going to be bullied by the United States and we're going to stand up for ourselves. This is the takeaway that the, that is trying to be presented to them and it's why it's important to push back against. Um, here's what else should make Lo Lopez Obrador the half-wit of the hemisphere, award winner at the LA Summit's uh, closing ceremonies. Uh, by promoting these three tyrannies, he's helping stoke the desperate migration that's flowing out through them in unprecedented waves today, exacerbating an immigration crisis, not only at the United States southern border, but across the Americas. That crisis is, in fact, arguably and rightfully the most urgent item etched in, uh, Biden etched into the summit agenda this week. And because Mexico, like the United States, feels the brunt of it, Lopez Obrador was supposed to be one of the heads of state leading plans to confront it. And as you have noted very articulately first, Kurt, AMLO has plans for this, plans that he's desperately trying to get America to listen to on this. And it's not AMLO sitting with his arms crossed in Mexico City, as they uh, note later. Um, it's actually the Biden administration and the United States Congress who's unwilling to hear uh, the plans that are being developed in the Americas to deal with the crisis. You're absolutely right. And I find it very amusing logic that AMLO supporting three tyrannies is, is, is stoking immigration. The more immigration is coming out of there. Really? Mm-hmm. Really? Based on what? Right? Maybe the U.S. supported coup in 2009 in Honduras had something to do with that. Maybe. Right? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, yeah. no doubt. Right. None of this. You know, maybe the sanctions on these countries, maybe the embargo on the countries have something to do with that. But there's no reflection on this. There's just no reflection on this whatsoever. Mm -hmm. so you just, you know, you're going to see the same things happening time, time and again. Right, and it's, and it's extraordinary, right? Um, I think <laughs> there's, there's, there's simply no way of conceiving of Latin America besides, right, just um, poor people desperate to get to the United States because the United States is so great. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's no understanding of the indigenous factor, the linguistic factor, the cultural factor, mm -hmm. the factor People don't want to immigrate of coups of this of that of global warming right climate mm -hmm. change affecting these countries none of this is ever considered mm -hmm. right? of the the complicated nature of 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 the multi-layered nature of of immigration none of this is ever considered and, and still you just you get i'm was a half wet and he's provoking immigration <laughs> oh, that, that really helps that, that really adds that really adds to the debate on this yeah, and this is the guy that's not one of the right wing radios. You know, <laughs> shock shocks. These, are the moderates. These are the moderates. These are people who are supposedly between the right and the left in U.S. terms. Well, that that really that's that's good. Yeah. Well, just so because I don't have to, I, I can only come through this so much before I lose my sanity. But this does show like less than even the actual politics and the the, for, the international relations bit of it. This does reveal a very, very kind of like center left moderate politics crisis yeah. here. Um, yeah. Because, again, I'm no expert in the media markets of Miami. I will own that. Um, but I guess, um, as they note in this piece, um, that the Latino uh, media network, which has more Democratic listeners and uh, um, funders, is actually going to be buying up uh, the right-wing radio station. I mean, mm -hmm. his advice to them is this. 
um, the me- mostly Democratic investors of the Latino uh, media network, which is announced that they're buying Radio Mami, need to be scrutinizing Lopez Obrador's theatrics just as closely. And they go on complaining about how they support Donald Trump. Um, if if the LMN wants to keep uh, keep Mambi a profitable concern, if it wants to be the long term caretaker of a more mainstream, balanced, and responsible Miami medium, the dumbest thing it could do is turn a Spanish speaking Fox into a Spanish speaking MSNBC, into a voice that finally challenges the MAG excesses of DeSantis, who's already got a new reelection reelection uh, at out. Um, warning that the the sale of Mambi is a part of a Marxist scheme, but goes softball on the knee jerk antics of Lopez Obrador's in Latin America or left wingers in the United States, right? So buy the network, but keep the kind of chest thumping bullshit, keep the kind of demonization of the Latin American left, right? It's like the perfect sort of like big brain solution. It's like, okay, well, I'm glad that, you know, these people might donate more money uh, to the Democratic Party, but please, please don't ramp down the American imperialism. Please do not do that. Yeah, that's right. We've got a winner there. Let's keep that. You know, if, if anything, there's a left critique to be made of AMLO in the sense that he's been too accommodating to the U.S., mm-hmm. That he's been too accommodating in allowing asylum seekers to wait for their asylum hearings in Mexico, right? Which happened under Trump and is continuing under Biden, right? Um, he's been too accommodating in, in trying to, um, you know, close things off at the southern border, right? With, with Guatemala, right? I mean, <clears throat> there's a left critique to be made of what AMLO is doing on immigration, right? So it's, it's actually amusing he is now the radical Marxist socialist halfwit on this, mm-hmm. all this, right? If he were that, then he would refuse to have American asylum seekers be waiting in, in, in Mexico, which I think he, you know, should. But there was inc- incredible pressure on that, right? Uh, he, he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be, you know, okay with, you know, um, militarizing or close to it, the southern border of Mexico, you know? In that sense, he's been he's been too accommodating, mm-hmm. right? But what you get here is just the most uninformed debate possible, right? And that's why nothing ever changes in this in, in this area, right? <clears throat> Even on, as you say, this kind of NPR lights, you know, center left kind of public radio debate. That that's the best you're going to get, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the best you get from our friends at the New York Times and the Post or whoever else that consider themselves to be enlightened liberals. Mm-hmm. That, 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 that's the best you're gonna get, and it's terrible. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, 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 so tr- it's uninformed, it's prejudiced, it's classist, it's racist, and it's just stupid, mm-hmm. finally, right? I mean, it just shows, unfortunately, how rough politics are in the in the United States, where you know we do have to spend um, you know so much time defending Amlo just because like the discourse around him is so reactionary and so right wing that like right. you know we're not even able to have these kind of <laughs> more in depth like left wing conversations um, Wait, about right. him. exactly exactly right and I get that in the Jacobin comments all the time and you know it's just a, what is he up against he is up against you know a, a total steamroller from the Western press. So just you just just to have one voice saying, you know, some of what's going on here, and it's not what they're saying, just that almost takes up a large part of my time, mm-hmm. right? And it doesn't allow us in the English language sphere to be having the kind of conversations that um, it would be nice to have. <clears throat> well, absolutely. Well, Kurt, we always appreciate you coming on and, and giving your perspective and, mm-hmm. and breaking these things down for us. Um, People can find uh, ways to follow uh, Kurt in the show notes. And uh, as always, we're happy to have you on Left Reckoning anytime. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kurt. Kurt. Appreciate it. Kurt's the man. Yeah, great having Kurt on. Well, before uh, we talk about something else, <clears throat> uh, we did need to do a quick update here. Because there was some unfortunate news as we were live um, that happened uh, regarding uh, somebody who, you know, Matt and I, I think, frankly, are generally fans of Ilhan Omar. Um, I'll share this right quick with you all. This was a letter that was sent out today. Oh, you already had it. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can go, I was back muted. Go back to yours. Um, this was a letter that was sent out today. 
Um, this is the quote from President Lopez Obrador has made clear that the safest journalists and protection of the free press is not a priority for his administration. In fact, President Lopez Obrador has frequently uh, denigrated and intimidated independent journalists. And 15 Democrats, uh, House Democrats, signed this letter, including um, Ilhan Omar. And we asked Kurt if he had a response to this, and I'll just read this uh, aloud to y'all uh, right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was obvious that almost bucking the United States on the summit of the Americas was going to be met with a response. This is part of it. This is another great example of how bipartisanship stops at the water's edge. When it comes to Latin America and the rest of the world, there is precious little difference between Republicans and Democrats, be they even part of the sacred squad. The trust fund point is absolute bullshit. He's responding to the letter in detail here. Um, those funds known as uh, Fidies uh, Comisios um, were ways to spend money outside of budgetary constraints while carrying funds over from year to year. In short, cesspools for corruption. Of course, AMLO got rid of them and good riddance. AMLO's attacks are on the plutocrats of Mexican media, the sold out millionaires who have made a very lucrative career out of being the paid attack dogs of corporate media and the interest behind them. He has never gone after the average journalist who is just getting by, which constitutes the vast majority of journalists in Mexico. It is extremely disingenuous to conflate the two. You know, that reminds me, you know, we, we this is the second time we've had Kurt on in, in recent uh, months. Uh, well, or at least like the Kurt, most. I, well, sorry, not to distract from the point, but Kurt actually is like OG left reckoning guest. He actually might yeah. be on the leaderboard for most appearances so far. Anyway, sorry, you're making and, a point. Uh, yeah, we uh, we had him on, and one of the articles we didn't get to is his discussion of the structure of Mexican media, mm -hmm. and um, you know, uh, we honestly we have to have him back for that. We do have to get into that. Totally. Well, y'all, um, I hope you picked up a lot of good stuff here. It's not over. Um, in just a second, maybe give us five minutes, ten minutes tops. Uh, we'll be over um, on twitch.tv slash left reckoning for the post game, which we're making free all of June um, for y'all. As always, please support the show at patreon.com slash left reckoning. We're going to be joined by our friend, Dr. Ben Burgess, um, to talk about a lot of things, including Bernie 2024. Ben's recent uh, run in with Slavoj Zizek. Uh, we're going to be talking Ted Cruz. I can't remember the right winger guy from McDonald's. I'll just call him the hamburger, hamburger again. Uh, we got a lot of fun stuff coming and also uh, your questions, comments and calls. So we'll see you all in just a little bit. Again, twitch.tv slash left reckoning. And thanks everybody so much for tuning in. Yeah. And uh, just uh, so you know, patrons who are worried about it, we will still give you the uh, unlisted YouTube link. Uh, yeah. um, so, but, uh, but yeah, for everybody, not a patron, which you should be patreon.com slash left reckoning. Um, uh, yeah, twitch.tv slash left right, right is where you want to see you all there in just a little bit. And uh, yeah, we'll see you there. Mm -hmm.